Hello beautiful friends, my name is Brittany. Welcome back or welcome to Ruskies and Reads. Today we are here to talk about all of the books that I have read so far in the month of December. So at the time of filming it is December 17th. I've actually only finished five books. Reading this month is going very very slowly just because I'm having to concentrate on other things but still I didn't want to get to the end of December and have like 10 books to wrap up for you so I am going to proceed with this mid-month wrap up. The very first book that I finished in December was Bountiful by Serena Bowen. This satisfied the TBR game prompt to continue a series. This is the fourth book in Serena Bowen's True North series. All of these books are set in this small town in Vermont and they primarily center around the Shipley family or at least people connected to the Shipley family and in book number four we're actually following Zara. She runs one of the local bars. Her uncle owns it and so she is managing it and taking care of it and at the very start of the story you're actually following her as she's trying to get over the relationship that she had with Griffin Shipley who was the main character in the very first book. They have just broken up a few months ago. She is pretty salty about it still and then one night a handsome red-headed man walks into her bar and they have a one-night stand that ends up turning into like a summer fling, a really passionate passionate, intense summer fling. There's obviously a connection and chemistry between the two, but Dave is actually a professional hockey player. And so at the end of his summer vacation, he has to return back to Brooklyn where he is on a professional hockey team. Soon after Dave goes back to Brooklyn, Zara actually realizes that she is pregnant and she doesn't really know how to get a hold of Dave. They never really exchanged contact information or anything like that. This was supposed to be just like a quick summer fling, not really meaning anything. So she ends up having a daughter named Nicole. And for the past 15 months, she has been raising her daughter Nicole with the help of her family and one day Dave actually walks back into her life. At this point in the story she is now a co-owner of a coffee shop that she runs with Audrey who is Griffin Shipley's wife at this point. And so Zara is definitely doing well for herself. She owns her own business. She has a beautiful daughter. Things are going really well and so she's kind of really definitely knocked off her feet when Dave walks back into her life. And so you're definitely seeing her as she is having to explain to Dave that he now has a daughter and so you're watching that transition as he has to kind of accept that he is a father and he he has to start walking into the role. Zara doesn't expect him to take on the role of father. She really never even expected to see him again and so she would completely understand if he decided to just like go away and never return but that's not really what kind of guy Dave is. He really wants to take responsibility and also he has deep feelings for Zara. He never really forgot Zara and he thinks that there is something between them and he doesn't really want to let that go. So the entirety of the story is watching those dynamics. You're watching Dave as he's trying to learn how to be a father. You're watching Zara as she's kind of letting Dave be a father and kind of letting go of the control that she's had for so long and putting her daughter kind of at risk for heartbreak you know if Dave doesn't stick around you're following Zara and Dave as they are coming back together again and finding each other and developing something more than what they had at the very beginning. I actually liked this one a lot. It is now my second favorite in this series. My first favorite was the second book which followed Jude. This was definitely a strong love story. I typically don't really enjoy stories that feature children heavily and I definitely don't like a fake pregnancy or an unexpected pregnancy trope but I feel like this unexpected pregnancy did it really well because in this instance it was completely by accident like they were having fun Zara ends up pregnant and then she takes responsibility for what she needs to do and she ends up raising her daughter she wasn't pregnant to try to trap Dave they weren't even like really actively in a relationship at the time she found out she was pregnant she never expected to see him again and so you're really just following her as she's growing as a mother and then how Dave ends up fitting in when he comes back to town I really loved the way that this was done I loved Zara as a character she was very headstrong and stubborn and I just overall enjoyed her her as a character and I also liked Dave as a character. He was a really good man and you could see that there was really nothing wrong with him or anything. He was a very successful sports player who was also dealing with the fact of his aging and the fact that he was going to have to age out of hockey eventually and how that kind of came into play when he was making the decisions about his future as well. So overall I just thought that this was really well done. It was really sweet. It was steamy at moments and I really enjoyed this and I gave it four stars. Next to satisfy the prompt of reading my most recent acquisition, I read Finley Donovan is Killing It by El Casamano and boy what a ride this was. So this follows our main character Finley Donovan and she is a struggling writer. At the very beginning of this story you can see that the bills are piling up you know and her car is falling apart, her house is a mess, her husband cheated on her and so they are now divorced and her husband is living with his new fiance so she is also a single mother of two and her ex-husband has unexpectedly fired the nanny so she's having to deal with the consequences of that now. It is a very chaotic and stressful time for Finley Donovan and she hasn't really been able to write anything new since the divorce because she typically writes suspense romance and she doesn't really believe 
and romance anymore and her agent is pushing her to complete a book especially since she was given like an advance for it and nothing has really come of it so there is a lot going on for Finley she's under a huge amount of pressure and when she's at Panera Bread talking to her agent about what her newest suspense book is going to be about that conversation along with some other kind of coincidental circumstances causes the woman at the next table to think Finley Donovan is a contract killer she slips Finley a note about her husband being a bad man and that he needs to be taken care of. Finley tries to explain that this woman has her all wrong, that she is not who she thinks she is. But out of curiosity, Finley wants to see this man and she wants to know if he is really as bad as his wife thinks. So she gets herself dressed up and she goes to this bar where she knows he is going to be and things kind of ensue from there. And this was a good time, but it was also kind of a serious time, not like serious in that, like a serious subject matter, but serious in the fact that this actually becomes a thing. <laughs> There's actually a crime that happens in here. Finley gets herself wrapped up in the world of murder basically and El Casamano writes this book in a way that makes you believe this could actually happen. Now do I really believe that contract killers would be out in Panera Bread discussing their business openly? No but everything else just the way that she wrote this really flowed and it really seemed plausible and believable and I actually really enjoyed this one a whole lot. Finley ends up being aided by Vero who was the nanny that her ex-husband fired and she had been returning to the house to grab some of her stuff and she kind of walks in on what is happening and she and Finley end up becoming partners in everything thing and it was just a great time. I enjoyed this one. I already have the sequel on my shelves and I definitely plan on getting to it. This was a solid four stars for me. It has been getting a lot of hype recently and I'm so glad that I enjoyed it as much as everybody else seemed to be enjoying it. Then I read Window Shopping by Tessa Bailey. This satisfied the TBR game prompt to read a book with red on the cover. This is a short and sweet holiday romance that follows our main character Stella and at the start of this book Stella has actually just been released from a correctional facility. She's only been out for about a month and she is kind of walking down Fifth Avenue and she stops in front of this window display of this very ritzy kind of department store and she is just awed by the window display not because of how amazing it is but because of how atrocious it is and suddenly a guy walks up and starts talking to her and Stella is really having none of it she is giving off I am not interested get the hell away from me kind of vibes but he asks her what she thinks of the window display and she is honest she says that it is horrific and he asks her what would she have done and she tells him and she gives a lot of great reasons behind how she would change the window display and I guess it had actually been a dream of hers at one point to kind of do that for a living to dress windows and this guy ends up being really impressed with her and he says you know what I believe that they are hiring a new window dresser and you should apply and Stella kind of shrugs it off because she now has a criminal record she doesn't think a ritzy department store would ever hire her but what she doesn't know is that the man that she was talking to was Aiden who is the general manager of the store and his family actually owns the store and so he was so very charmed and attracted to Stella very fascinated by her that when all of the applications for the window dresser start to come in he is specifically seeking hers out and when he sees that he has a criminal record he knows that it would be very difficult to like come convince the board there to hire her but he's willing to do whatever he has to so he invites literally every applicant in for an interview including Stella and he makes the conclusion based on like what she says in the interview that she is the right person for the job so he hires her and it goes from there. I was a little bit worried because this was so short I was worried that it wasn't going to be able to give me like the impact or the substance that I was looking for but this really did. I felt like this was a solid holiday romance. I really liked both of the characters. Both of the characters in this story are dealing with their own stuff. Aiden is obviously having to deal with the fact that his family owned the store and he kind of has this idea that he always needs to be positive and perfect that he can never be real and show some of his true feelings so he is definitely dealing with his own stuff and then of course Stella having recently been released from a correctional facility is having to deal with the ramifications of her past and some of the stuff that kind of comes back from that and overall I just thought that this was really well done it was small but it packed a punch and then the relationship between Aiden and Stella was just so wonderful you could feel the chemistry between them and even though this was a small book Tessa Bailey definitely did did manage to create this wonderful romance and I highly enjoyed it. Next I finished Book Lovers by Emily Henry and this satisfied the prompt to read a book that was on someone else's TBR. This was actually a book club pick for a book club that I'm a part of so I knew it was going to be on many people's TBRs so I cheated in that little bit. This book was fantastic. It is in my opinion Emily Henry's strongest to date. It is definitely my favorite of the three that I have read by her. So Book Lovers follows Nora Stevens. She is essentially a cutthroat literary agent in New York City. She loves the city. She loves her job. She is always willing to do anything that she has to for a client and she is very focused and dedicated to her work. A lot of people on the outside kind of see her as a little bit cold and they call her the shark just because of how cutthroat she is when it comes to her clients. But they don't really know deep down all of the things that go into making Nora who she is. It primarily stems from the unexpected death of her mother when she was in her early 20s and her sister was just a teenager and she kind of ended up being the caretaker for her sister at that time because her mother was no longer around and so there's still a lot of grief 
life and residual trauma from that. And she has always worked so hard to make sure that her sister has everything that she could possibly need. And so that is a huge motivating factor behind how and why Nora is the way she is and why she is so dedicated to her job. Nora and her sister Libby were once very, very close and inseparable and they are still very close, but not as tight as they once were. Nora kind of feels them drifting apart. They definitely don't tell each other everything like they used to tell each other. And so when Libby suggests that they take a girl's trip for about three to four weeks to this place called Sunshine Falls, North Carolina, Nora is a bit hesitant at first, but she's willing to do it because she wants to get back to where she was with her sister. And she knows that her sister kind of needs the time away. Her sister is married with two children and one on the way, and she definitely looks like she needs a break. And so Nora is willing to go on this vacation. And the reason why they're going to this small town in North Carolina is because it is actually the setting of this really, really popular book that Nora helped get published. And so Libby wants to go there. She has a checklist of everything she wants them to experience while they're there. And when they're there, Nora unexpectedly runs into Charlie Lastra. Now at the very, very beginning of the story, you see Nora have her very first encounter with Charlie Lastra. He is a book editor. And so she is actually going to pitch this book that is now an international sensation. She's going to pitch this book to Charlie because she wants him to edit the book and help get it published. But Charlie basically starts the meeting by saying he thinks the book is terrible. So the meeting is definitely not productive. It gets off on the very wrong foot. And now she is unexpectedly running into Charlie Lastra in the small town in North Carolina, the very last place she expected him to be. And it definitely goes from there. I felt that this book was extremely multi-layered. I would say as equally dedicated to Nora and her relationship with Libby as it was Nora and her developing relationship with Charlie. So they were both equally focused here. There wasn't, I don't feel, a focus more on one or the other. In fact, if I if there was more than one, I would definitely say it was on this sister relationship. So that was a very complex relationship because, like I said, Nora had to take on the motherly role after their mother died. And in fact, she was also kind of always a mother role to Libby because their mother was kind of like this free spirit. And so Nora often found herself taking on the motherly role of Libby. And she has kind of maintained that throughout their entire life. So sometimes she can be very, not necessarily controlling, but she's a fixer. She wants to fix things. And that definitely translates over into this vacation because Nora can actually tell that there is something more going on with Libby, something more than maybe just being tired and needing some breaks from her kids. But Libby is not telling her. So Nora is kind of spiraling because she doesn't know what is going on with her sister. Her sister will not reveal that information. So there's a lot going on with that relationship. And then you're following her as she and Charlie definitely start to grow closer. And can I just say the banter was perfect. The banter between Charlie and Nora was snark. It was fantastic. And the scenes that included the Bigfoot erotica were just amazing. I was giggling so hard at that. They were so perfect. Charlie, of course, is also dealing with his own issues because he never wanted to return to Sunshine Falls, which turns out is his hometown. He's going back to help take care of things because his father has had some medical issues and he feels like he needs to be there. And also his mother owns this small little bookshop that she can't really feasibly run and help take care of their dad. And so he is there helping to run the bookshop and just kind of nail things down. But he never really wanted to return there. He's always felt very much like an outsider there. He feels very claustrophobic in this town. So he is not happy there. And he is having to deal with his own issues concerning the family. And so Nora helps him, he helps Nora. And it was just a beautiful relationship. They obviously have a lot of chemistry. They obviously have great banter and a great bond. And it was just such a pleasure to watch that develop. I loved it. And I really loved the ending. I really loved the ending. I thought it was so sweet. There is definitely a lot to unpack in the book. There's a lot of deeper things that are happening. And I enjoyed this one. I think I'm going to go ahead and settle on a 4.5 stars. Not necessarily a five star, just because there was a lot of repetition. Like there were a lot of moments where like Charlie and Nora seem like they were going to get together and then they pushed themselves apart because they're like, no, we can't do this. We can't get involved. But overall, it was just such a great love story. It was also a great story of family and loyalty and familial bonds and trauma and grief. And there was just a lot, like I said, very multi-layered in this story and I enjoyed it a lot. So 4.5 stars. I definitely was swooning throughout the story and I was a little bit teary by the end because I was just like so happy with how the book ended and how it all turned out. I highly recommend, especially if you are already a fan of Emily Henry and you have not read this, need to do it. If you're not necessarily maybe a romance person, I still think that you could get a, a lot of enjoyment out of this one. I sure did. So this is definitely a 4.5 solid book for me. And then the very last book that I'm going to talk to you about today is my most recent read. And here I think is where I need to tell Sarah from Sarah's Nightstand to turn this off because I'm about to say not great things about Daisy Darker by Alice Feeney. So Daisy Darker is Alice Feeney's take on the And Then There Were None trope. This follows our main character Daisy Darker and she and her fractured family are going to be meeting on this small tiny tidal island out on the coast which is where her Nana has basically lived for her entire life. And it is Nana's 80th birthday and she has asked them all to gather there to help celebrate. This is definitely a very dysfunctional family. They haven't really seen or talked to each other in a really long time. Daisy's two sisters are going to be there, Daisy's niece as well as Daisy's father and mother and then an old 
family friend that kind of grew up with the girls and Nana took care of over his lifetime. So you're following them as they are all converging on this island. There is definitely some estrangement. And then at the stroke of midnight on her 80th birthday, Nana is dead and nobody knows what happened to her. Nobody knows who could have possibly done it. But basically every hour on the hour, another person is killed and there are some clues being left, some videotapes with home movies that say like, watch me, notice me, see me, things of that nature. So they're trying to figure out who could possibly do this, who could possibly have such a grudge against their family. And it goes from there. So let's talk about Alice Feeney's writing style. First of all, the overuse of similes and metaphors in here was absolutely obnoxious. She continuously said things like life is like, love is like, and then proceeded to do these really elaborate metaphors. And she did that multiple times throughout the entirety of this story. Additionally, I don't know if Alice Feeney wanted to be some kind of motivational speaker or self-help guru in another life, but this book was also filtered through with like little gems of wisdom that Nana would say or things like that or little observations. I had no idea why those were so frequent throughout this book. The similes, the metaphors, the little nuggets of wisdom, it just didn't work for me. It just didn't fit very well with the story. It didn't have any place. It was almost like Alice Feeney had no other way to communicate what she was trying to say. Additionally, literally all this book is, is Daisy Darker lamenting on the past and her experiences with her awful family. None of the characters in here are likable at all. They were all absolutely terrible to Daisy. Her sisters especially, her father was very absent throughout his childhood because he was like a conductor and he was always on tour with his orchestra never really around. Her mother was distant because her mother kind of blamed herself for the fact that Daisy was born with heart condition. So Daisy never really had the best childhood. The only really reliable person, the one that she knew loved her was her Nana. So a lot of the characters in here are just really, really unlikable. And the bulk of the story is Daisy going back into the past, reliving some of the moments with her family. And then of course, like I said, there are home movies being left for them as clues. And so you'll see them pop in the videotape and then they're reliving the memories that way. That's really all this was. It was almost like Alice Feeney tried to make this a very character driven system suspense novel without giving you enough to actually like or connect with the characters. This is entirely told through Daisy's perspective. You're not even really getting the perspectives of any of the other characters. So that right there adds a sense of disconnect to this story. And then just the things that you find out about them, you're just like, why do we even care about these stories? It wasn't suspenseful. It wasn't thrilling. This, this was very, very slow moving. And quite honestly, I was bored for the vast majority of the story. I considered DNFing it, but I was like, you know what? I got to push through. I'm going to want to know what happened. So I'm just going to push through. But I was so, so bored through a lot of this story. Then we get to about the last hour of listening time on the audiobook. And that's when things start to really get interesting. You find out the whodunit and then a big twist is revealed. And the sad thing about this twist is that I actually predicted this within the first chapter or two of the story. Now I couldn't tell you how that twist was going to connect with the murders or the whodunit or the why they did it. Like I didn't know that, but I had a feeling about what one of the big twists was. And I was absolutely right because it was so so easy. It was so easy to tell, especially if you've read a lot of these books in the past. Now I will say that the very final twist, when you find out the full who done it and the why they did it was really interesting. That was the most interesting thing about this book to me. Also, there was a pretty clever poem going on through here about all of the characters in the story. And I thought that was really great as well. I thought that was really well written. But other than that, there was really nothing redeemable about this story to me. I didn't like the characters. I didn't care about the characters. I was bored throughout a lot of this. I didn't care about their family history. I didn't really know why we were getting so much of this family's past. Now, obviously it was meant to give you context for like why things were happening as they were happening in the future, but I just didn't care. I could care less about the people in the story. They were so unlikable. I am just ultimately very disappointed in the story. I was solidly sitting at a two until the very end of the story, which made me consider bumping it up to a three. But since, since the vast majority of the reading experience of this for me was not very positive, I'm going to settle at a 2.5. I am so sorry, Sarah. I know this was a five-star read for you, but it just did not work for me. All right, y'all, that is it. Those are all of the books that I've read so far in the month of November. If you have read any of these books, please comment down below and let me know what your thoughts are. Do you agree with me on any of the books that I have read or disagree with me? I would love to know. And as always, if you like this video or if you just like me, please be sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already, because I would sure love to see you in my next video. Bye guys.